I'm Mark Unger, producer of Roundtable. Because we find this presentation so special, we really would like for you to see this. Please watch. Good evening, and welcome to Manhattan Neighborhoods Network Roundtable uh, uh, round Single Shot. Uh, don't judge the book by its cover. We're always saying it, we never actually do it. And every visual artist by now knows how important uh, the way his work is represented, uh, the way his work is framed, and for photographers, uh, also the way it's printed coming into play. And in order to discuss it, we invited uh, uh, the one of the oldest American uh, molding companies uh, uh, which works with prints and uh, framing, Wilson Molding. So we have uh, uh, Matthew and uh, Hashmat. Hashmat. Here, good evening guys, thank evening. you very much for coming and uh, thank you very much for being ready to share with us what you know about making it look really well on the wall. So, uh, recently the American market of uh, ways of reproducing visual work exploded. And I know that the company is very old, 140 years old, but uh, you stay on top of it and you know probably everything about how it has to be reproduced. So uh, when the artist is choosing his uh, way of presenting his work to the public, what would you say is the single most important thing he has to uh, consider? Well, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to be here, um, so thank you for having us. Um, and there are many different uh, there are many different aspects that you should consider when you're reproducing artwork for display. Um, one of the first things that you should consider is what kind of an impact would you like to have on the person who's viewing the photograph. Um, there are many different ways that we could print photography, many different types of media that we could use, many different framing options, many mm -hmm. different substrate options. Um, so you really want to come to an idea as to what kind of an image you would like to have in the world and what kind of connection you would like the viewer to have with the piece. Mm -hmm. So some considerations should go into the subject matter of the photograph itself. Um, is it a black and white piece? Is it portrait photography? Is it fashion photography? Uh, is it abstract photography, reproduction photography? Um, how heavily are you going to edit it after you've taken the photograph? Are you printing directly from a raw file? Um, are you doing a chemical print, a digital print? What type of photograph is it in the first place? Um, and then some consideration should go into how you'd like to manipulate it um, and how you'd like to transform it and deliver it to the audience. So some aspects that can be considered are subject matter, mm -hmm. color scheme, um, and desired effect. What kind of emotional connection would you like the viewer to have with the piece? Mm, so uh, it is uh, related to the subject matter as well. As, uh, when I was choosing my uh, media for print, and uh, I'm not choosing it lightly, believe me, mm. I was always more focused on uh, the brightness and color combination, which in my uh, understanding was always dictating the media. But uh, not, how not necessarily. Not necessarily. Um, black and white photographs tend to look better on matte papers, uh, nice double weight matte paper, velvet, um, just because when you start putting that uh, satin or even a gloss coating over a black and white, a lot of the details and the shadow and the highlights and the tones can be lost from the reflection of the paper itself. And you're also not going to get that deep, rich black tones that you get. Um, from a digital printer, an aqueous printer, using a matte black ink as opposed to a photo black ink. Whereas if you have a nice landscape or a portrait and you want really sharp, crisp lines, um, you're going to want to use a luster paper or gloss paper because there you'll really get that contrast and the differences in saturations will really come through so you'll be able to get that pop out of the photograph that you need. So basically the rule of a thumb, if uh, one subject is a focus of uh, the work, 
you uh, should try to avoid glossing it? Uh, not necessarily. What I would say is black and white photography tends to look best on matte papers. Landscape photography and portrait photography tends to look best on a semi-matte um, or luster paper. And abstract photography could go into some specialty papers such as a pearlescent or a metallic photo paper, um, if not a Beretta rag or any other specialty media of your choice. And uh, what about the longevity? Uh, artists normally forget about that very important yes. aspect and they look at it, it looks nice, fine. Yes. In a year it's getting discolored and uh, it's losing all the panache it had in the beginning. This is true. Now discoloration comes in many different forms. Um, first thing to consider when you're making your print, um, if you really want it to be you know, a long lasting print, you should consider getting something called an archival pigment print. And what that is, is you're literally using archival pigments on a quality media um, to present your work. Now there are very inexpensive ways of printing your pieces, you could go to Staples and you can get something done inexpensively, you could go to some place like that and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but that does not have the properties in the piece itself to last. So you'll want to consider getting papers rated for archival purposes that are going to last 50 years. You want to use archival pigments in the inks that you're using to print it. Um, and you also want to protect it and present it properly. So even if you get the best print you possibly can or the best rated paper or the best inks available, if you go and put that unprotected in your window facing east every day, it's going to be discolored in a matter of days. Naturally, yeah. So you need to take many considerations when it comes to protecting the piece over the course of its lifetime. Well, printing is intricate and uh, I actually learned some pretty fascinating new things myself. I didn't expect that to happen. Uh, but uh, besides just printing the work, there is a second stage, which is framing. Yes, and framing it, I think Hashmat is better suited as he's been doing this for about as long as I've been alive. So. Mm. Oh. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much for giving us an opportunity this evening to be with you guys in your studio. And um, uh, as you were s mentioning a minute ago, uh, basically framing is the last brush stroke on a piece of art. I mean, just as important as uh, mm. looking for the right uh, material to print your prints and or your artwork, it's just as important to pick the right frame that complements and sort of um, takes that from your mind to someone else's mind in a way that you really thought of it from the beginning when you come up with that image. So picking the right colors and picking the right frame will enhance that experience that the viewers will have eventually. So mm, it's important sometimes like for black and white, we tend to go with more modern, like let's say simple black uh, frame and maybe or a white frame and a white mat, or at times even right now people are becoming more simplistic and they simply frame it full size and they do a shadow box lining to kind of drop down the image a little bit just to be playful with the work, but in a very subtle way. And uh, that, you know, kind of makes the piece look great. But when you have, let's say, a work on a canvas and it's stretched, uh, you can do different things. I mean, if you want to do more classical way, you could go and put a liner and do a maybe a little bit of more ornate frame. Uh, that's fine too. But today, uh, with uh, life being so complicated, people try to uh, decorate their houses very modern and, and uh, you know, people like mostly floaters, just simply something to present the work and then uh, simply presenting the work uh, to have simple things on their walls and their mind to look at. Uh, what do you think of this tendency as, as a professional? Do you think it's a healthy uh, move towards simplification of art, which we see in uh, every media? or? It's something temporarily and we will get back to mm -hmm. actually framing the artworks actively. Well, like uh, anything else, I mean, uh, you know, we are uh, making advancement in life. I mean, I think it's healthy because at times when we have a lot in our mind, we want to 
make things easier for us. I mean, at least sitting in your living room or sitting in your bedroom, it should be a relaxing experience. Not, you know, it's yeah. not work. It's just you want to. But uh, I think it's uh, totally healthy. And, you know, people do what they feel best. And, you know, we have still a lot of people who want those ornate and very intricate kind of frame framing jobs done that, uh, you know, people do used to do 20, 30 years ago. And there are a bunch of new people that they want to have a uh, modern frame because their life is too involved. And when they come in the evening, they uh, when they spend time in their living room and their bedrooms, they want to simply just uh, look at a simple wall. And I think that's fine. It's their choice. And I think it should be healthy. I mean, yeah. humorously enough, uh, all my artistic career, I was trying to avoid frames. Yes. But recently I started to uh, use them and uh, for me, they really sta started to feel and sound like we mentioned before as uh, this either period or exclamation point in the end of the sentence, correct? Yeah. But uh, I, I agree with uh, what you're saying. A lot of artists tend to hesitate when it comes to framing and sometimes they think that framing will be something that will uh, kind of compete with their artwork. But a good framing will never compete and it will only enhance the look. Precisely. And uh, after this short break, we will uh, talk about framing in terms of displaying work at the exhibition. single trick by single shot. Today I want to tell you about the least quantifiable quantity of the lens. I will be talking a lot about it and that would be uh, the lens character. It's a combination of uh, lens optics, the way they made, the way they coded, its properties uh, based on its focal length and everything else which makes every lens to have a unique way it interprets the image. In order to show you the difference I brought three lenses that uh, all the same focal length, 135 millimeters, made for the same kind of camera and uh, at the same time period. They're made by Leica, Zeiss and Schneider. So I will just take a picture with all three of them and you will be able to see the difference uh, yourself. And that's pretty much what lens character is. I wanted to uh, touch basis on is uh, impact of correct printing and especially uh, correct framing on uh, how the works are perceived by collectors and visitors of the exhibitions when the artist is bringing them to the public. And uh, in my opinion, in, uh, frame is one single thing that can either add or subtract tremendously from already finished artwork. As uh, we mentioned before the break, a lot of people believe uh, it will uh, compete with their work and they kind of hesitant to give a lot of prominence and exposure. But the uh, thing is, a lot of works are requiring uh, a person to come and look into them, to co uh, comprehend the details, to appreciate the story. And uh, if they just pass him by, they can just pass by. And I believe that that's exactly where the correct framing can come into a play. Yes, true. And in terms of uh, framing an artwork also, I believe, just like uh, Matthew was mentioning a minute ago, mm, uh, one of the things to consider is that uh, the way we frame the longevity of the piece. I mean, uh, doing the right frame uh, is, to me, two-sided. One, it helps in longevity of the print work mm -hmm. or any kind of media that you print on number one and number two it can really complements the artwork in a way that uh, when the viewer sees it I mean really it, a lot of the time artists when they print something or when they paint things 
they have that certain perception in their mind that looks everything looks perfect but now to be able to translate that from an artist perspective to a viewer perspective you need to dress that up so I mean uh, if you today you see for example when we go and buy an iPhone or buy a laptop in uh, in a Apple store I mean when you open this it's um, packed so beautifully that it helps the iPhones and the laptops not to break and not to get damaged and even opening that for for the buyer at home it's an amazing experience to open that mm. and to see that so we could look at framing as iPhone really putting that beautiful cover to take care of those iPhone and iPads to the customers and at the same time, you know, not taken away. I mean, when a, when a person buys that uh, iPhone and takes it home, is not just worried, you know, n not going to worry about uh, the packaging itself, but he, he cares about the iPhone, basically. Precisely. But if that iPhone, you just simply give it just like that without any cover or anything, first of all, transportation <laughs> become difficult. Second, uh, you know, uh, somebody's going to think that's, probably uh, uh, you know none worth yeah. none worth uh, piece of uh, material that you're Absolutely, given to them. Yes. so packaging that iPhone is the same as a framing a piece right to uh, give the viewer a different look it's an excellent yep. analogy indeed yeah. and uh, talking about uh, giving it a right look for the exhibition uh, does uh, it actually make sense to have one type of framing for the exhibitions and present another framing for the people to take home or it oh. should be working for both uh, purposes? Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, uh, in my opinion, what looks good, you know, uh, what looks good on the exhibition, it will look good in the houses too. And basically it all, to me, uh, good framing comes to the point where you're showing the artwork at its best and whatever that you could do that it should work for the exhibition and it should work also for the house i mean why a consumer deserve less than a show oh, less than an exhibition no reason yeah so i mean why uh, people in exhibition deserve less than people who buy and they uh, live in a home well, uh, e as we was discussing before, it actually a uh, completely different situations. What people want to bring home is something they want to live with. <laughs> and uh, sure. what uh, they see on the exhibition first have to stop them. Uh, I've met uh, Matthew on the iPad and uh, there was thousands of people pass passing by hundreds of booths. Yeah. And by some of them they would stop, by some of them they wo uh, wo uh, wouldn't. I stopped by the booth that was uh, presenting Wilson's products because of the beautiful installation you had on the wall. Yes. And uh, that was this exclamation point yeah. that actually made me to look and come to comprehend the details of what is in, in inside. Yes. So that's what I was Yes, about. And, and you're right, and I, I really hope that Wilson can keep that tradition at uh, Wilson itself and everywhere Wilson goes. No. Definitely. But yeah. furthermore, to the point of presenting the artwork for an exhibition, uh -huh. it's similar to um, dressing up for a party. So how do you want to look for the party? What kind of party is it going to be? And like you said, we want to stop people. And everybody has their own taste in art, and everybody has their own um, taste in framing as well. So it's how do you want to present your artwork? now? If you are coming at this from a business perspective, you would be wise to frame it simply with a simple white mat and either a white frame or a black frame because it's not only economical, but most consumers could vision that on any wall in any home in America. Um, now, if you wanted to create a statement with your frame, you might consider going with a three, four inch wide, thick, gloss, red frame that's going to complement a certain hue in the photograph. And I've seen it happen and it works. Um, so it, it's very similar to um, how you want to present yourself is how you would like to present your artwork because your artwork as a photographer is an extension of yourself and it's a glimpse into the way that you see the world so the same way you get dressed in the morning you look in the mirror and you present yourself the way that you would like to be presented i recommend that artists present their art the way that they would like people to see it so 
Um, basically, not thinking in terms of what consumer would want, but in terms of matching the personality in a way. Well, as an artist, it's about completing your work and stating that here, this is ready. And when it comes to framing the work, as you had mentioned, some people don't necessarily frame it and they put it up, just like getting dressed in the morning. <laughs> um, when it comes to exhibiting artwork, it is standard practice and expected to be framed and properly ready to be presented. Natural. And it would be out of line to present something that just wasn't ready to be shown. Well, um, since you guys are experts in displaying uh, art, period, there is one question that uh, I always hear a lot of controversy on. There are two opinions about the body of work that need to be presented on the exhibition. One group saying that it has to be coherent, it has to be similar uh, type of color palette, similar subject, it has to be a body of work per se. Another uh, opinion is the more eclectic it is, the more diverse it is, the more interesting it is. What do you think uh, is a correct one? I think I know the answer just by the <laughs> way the yeah, display looked, but... Well, I would say that if it were a little bit of everything but all over the place and scattered, you're not really going anywhere with it. And if it were focused and in-depth and you know really well-developed, then you could really get a sense of what kind of an artist this photographer is and perhaps even look into more of their work. So I think it would be best to focus on and build upon and take advantage upon your strengths um, to try to present your artwork rather than just try to show a little bit of everything. No, I, would, I was almost positive that would be the <laughs> answer and, and that's what I... But also in my opinion, just reiterate in my opinion, also, uh, for example, when you start as an artist, as an up-and-coming artist, it may take a minute for you to find out really where you're heading, where your interests lie, because you may have, um, I mean, I know of a uh, few artists who are personal friends, I mean, th still they're in a position where they want to find themselves. I have this talent, I have this talent, I have this talent. Which one I want to pursue further? So at that stage, it's fine, but after a while, when you're a mature uh, artist and you already uh, people attach you with some sort of uh, genre i mean i would say that i would just focus on that and try to develop the best in me and as an artist and go with so that consistency is a sign of maturity uh, we'll be it back to the start after the break it will hello this is alex ig uh, from single shot with the next uh, single trick Today we're going to be talking about uneven lighting. More often uh, you have to deal with just one strong source of light. The strongest one of course would be the sun. And uh, when it happens, uh, half of your object is uh, lit in very brightly and another half is very dark. Just like my face right now. Is there anything you can do about it? Sure. You can uh, have professional lighting equipment, you can have professional light bouncing uh, screens and many other things. But uh, the simplest and easiest uh, thing you can use, especially if uh, you're doing it in a uh, casual environment, is a regular piece of paper. Put it right against uh, the direction of light and you will get the uh, source of light uh, uh, balanced and your light uh, being just right. from what we was discussing before, that uh, besides everything else, uh, unified framing for the body of work can actually help with uh, having it to be a little too diverse. So that's where your expertise is coming in. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I j didn't understand the question. If I uh, It wasn't the question. Yeah. I was just uh, yeah. trying to say that uh, if uh, the works are very different from each other yes. and they don't form by themselves yes. unified body of work, yeah. similar framing, done correctly can actually help to unify them and to make them into one coherent presentation. 
Yes, it's true, and uh, in many instances, a lot of artists uh, that uh, we have worked with, that if, even if they had a different body of work, we try to uh, see and then and, and frame them in a similar way to give every one of those paintings equal chance for people to see. But still doing that, you have to still make sure that you're doing justice for each piece. You Perfect. Want, you want All to right. avoid it looking like a cookie cutter selection of picture frames. You can pick a theme, let's say black frames. There are many different profiles of black frames. You could have a one inch wide profile, two inch wide profile, one inch deep, two inches deep, do some with the shadow box, some without, some with the eight ply mat, four ply mat. So consistency, but diversity. Perfect. Consistency and diversity. And talking about diversity, you brought uh, several examples of yes. what uh, Wilson does. And I can't uh, miss the opportunity of looking at them and sure. asking you what they are about. Well, let's start with something that we've just recently invented here. Um, you were asking for new and exciting products. So a face mount in and of itself is not something new, but what we've done here is we've actually done a second surface mount of a gloss photographic print behind eighth inch acrylic. And then what we've done is we've bent it around the side here. Ah. So this looks almost like a stretched canvas that can then hang flush on your this wall. This actually is an excellent display, more on a business side than a private home side in my opinion, but it looks like a million dollars as they say in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well this is this is excellent. It's just showing that third dimension of two-dimensional art oh, forms. That's one of those uh, trends I was talking about. That's absolutely. And what about those two guys? I know that you have something very striking. I'm not sure if our camera would be able to capture the difference. Most but likely not. But what but we have is try. a print-on luster paper here, where you can see it's a nice, you know, variety of colors, wide range. Lots of different saturations, and here is a metallic photo print. Which really pops, especially for the picture like this. Absolutely. Oh, there are still so many questions I wanted to ask you, but uh, unfortunately our time is up. Thank you very much, Thank gentlemen, you for, for having coming. Us. Thank you for uh, having It was us. really enlightening, and uh, I will pay even more attention to how my works are displayed from now on. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Really a pleasure, thank yeah, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. found that worth watching as much as I did. I'm Mark Unger for Roundtable. Thanks for watching.